In this episode of Mighty Car Mods, we are looking at the top five mad cars that you can buy on a budget that are rad to modify. Welcome to another episode of Mighty Car Mods. In this episode, we're gonna go through the top five cars that we think are awesome performance bargains. Now, this is Marty, I'm Moog. This is our YouTube channel, Mighty Car Mods, and we've been making videos on YouTube showing people how to modify cars for the last 15 years. We've traveled all over the world. We've modified budget cars. We've modified expensive cars. There's been JDM heroes. There's been absolute nuggets that we've bought off Facebook that we would just prefer to forget, except the videos are still there. And so we're trying to kind of get all of this information together and go, if you're on a budget, but you want a mad car, what is a car that can kind of do a whole lot of different things? Uh, and our criteria is looking at fun, it's looking at practicality, it's looking at the community, it's looking at modifications, and it's looking at budget. We want this to be something that is relatively affordable. So this here is the top five budget cars to buy and modify according to Mighty Colors. So number five on our list and kicking off our top five is the Honda Civic. Now is the Honda Civic controversial? To some people it is. For a long time they were pigeon holders being sort of the crappier version and you couldn't really do much fun with them but times have changed, technology have changed and now there's some absolute monster Honda Civics getting around. There's also a lot of different models so we can go far as back as like an EG, there's still a few of them left which was one of the ones we've had, then EK like our yellow one back here and then you can go into the newer models, the Type R's, the stuff that sort of happened since then. There is a sweet spot where you can get them for like between five and fifteen thousand dollars Australian which we think is about right. Now we have had a few Civics on the show over the years. Some of them have been a little bit questionable. Let's be honest, some of them have had a bit of a smell. So one of them I believe, Martin, we even installed a fake turbo on, which was great. <laughs> Times have moved on since then and there was a massive series that Marty was the Captain Sparrow of and he sailed us into the VTEC with this mad yellow Civic behind us. Now, an EK Civic 90. 5, 96, 97, yeah. you can get them for around about $5,000 or the Type R Civics which is around 2009. Right now you can get them for as cheap as thirteen dollars or $14,000. Why do people like them? Well, they're cheap and front wheel drive. I don't know if people like them because they're front wheel drive but they just are front wheel drive. Uh, there are heaps of parts heaps. available for them and that's something that you experienced when you were yeah. working on it, right? There's just Massive so up. much stuff. You don't have to fabricate a whole bunch of stuff yourself, which is good if you don't have the equipment or the skills. There's a massive aftermarket of stuff. Every part you can dream of has probably been made, and that also drives the price down because you've got all these options. Yep. You know, you don't always have to use Honda Genuine. There's a, like a massive sort of gamut of different um, kinds of parts that you can use from really expensive, crazy stuff to cheap and cheerful, which will get the job done. And there are tried and tested recipes all the way from just kind of lowered springs, wheels and tyres, all the way through to absolutely ridiculous All builds, drive, like serious like drag cars yeah. with like huge slicks and stuff on the front. Yeah. The other thing is as well is that Civics, while you might not have the cool one, because there's so many of them available that were locally delivered, you can go to a wrecker and there's parts available. It's not like trying to find something for an MR2 or something that is going to be a little bit more unique uh, to try and find. Uh, so you can go from basic to extreme. A lot of people like them because they say they have like over-engineered handling. Is that yeah, correct, Martin, they, as they a do, Honda owner? They do handle well. There's a lot of um, people that are doing really well on, on track days and in race series using Honda Civics because the suspension design is actually pretty good, pretty modern and very adjustable and again aftermarket parts um, definitely come into that as well. And so one thing to think about is there's a lot of these Civics were made and this will, this will apply to a few of the cars we talked to you about. A lot of them were made which means there's a lot of them at wreckers that you can draw parts from. There's also a big aftermarket. That means it's not as special and unique necessarily but this is where you can put your own twist on it to make it special and unique in the exact way that you want without having to spend an absolute bomb. What I will say is that they are fun to drive and there is a huge community um, online and in the real world for um, Honda Civics. Also for Integras and other cars as well like that, but if you want to try and get a car that's going to get you into a community of lots of different people, meet some friends and stuff like that, Honda Civic is a really good choice. So let's have a quick look at our Honda Civic. So when it comes to Honda Civics, what can you expect to get for your money? Well, this is one that we picked up recently for around $4,000. It is white, it is running, it is registered, it's done about 220,000 Ks, which for how old it is, is not a whole lot. But what's most important about this is that it drives, it doesn't stink, and inside it is manual, powered by the D16 four-cylinder 
1.6 litre that is under the bonnet. The mighty D16. So most Civics came with this engine. It's single cam. It does not have VTEC, uh, but it's very reliable. Um, they don't really leak. They just work. You keep them serviced and they will last pretty much forever. But most people end up modifying them, which is exactly what we did, because this is our Honda Civic. It is bright yellow, and most importantly, we did engine swap it and put a B16 into it, uh, which ha has VTEC double overhead cam. Makes some pretty good power for what it is. Now, this here is pretty much a car that will do it all, and while a lot of people spend a lot of time and money underneath the hood, this one here, obviously, we went to town on this car. There's a full series on it. It's had a paint job as well. What could you expect to pay for something like this? Well, minus the paint job, but still with the performance, probably under $15,000, which is a bit of a kind of a cap that we've got on today's video. In this kind of condition, probably worth a little bit more because so much time and money has been spent. Inside the car, it's functional, it's fairly basic. You're not gonna expect kind of Volkswagen levels of, um, of comfort and technology, but for the money, either of those is a really good option. So you've got something like this that's gonna cost you maybe around $15,000, or to get you started, something like this for around $4,000. So there it is, that is the Honda Civic. Now for each of these cars, we're also going to find the dark side of the light because there is a ying and there is a yang. So what is an alternate that is a similar car for a similar price and was around at a similar time? I would call it the negative alternative in yep. this particular case. Uh, and we've decided that is the Toyota Corolla. Why? Um, oh, what a boring car. Good cars, but oh, what a boring car, exactly. Um, not as much aftermarket support, not as many people making crazy fast ones, which means that sort of level of build and engineering isn't there. There were other front wheel drive things around the time, like Pulsars and other European cars, but Civics really did stand out and they have stood the test of time because these things are still really popular and people are doing some really awesome stuff with them. That's right. And the other thing is, well, I think that while there are lots and lots of Toyota Corollas out there for getting parts, they don't seem to have that kind of street cred and aftermarket appeal on a mass appeal that Hondas do. And if you go to, um, you know, any kind of meet, JDM meets, cars and coffee, things like that. You will see lots of Civics, you won't see lots of Toyotas. It's not just Toyota Corollas, it's not to say they're not a good car, it's just they don't have that kind of general pizzazz yep. that the Honda Civic has. And Toyota has lots of other good options and that's another reason. So if you're a Toyota fan, you might not pick just a base model front wheel drive Corolla, you might pick something else that's cool. In fact, Martin, there is a Toyota coming up soon on our list. But first, it's time to dive in to car number four. Car number four is a Subaru WRX. It's hard to go anywhere in the world to a meet and not see these cars. They are just everywhere. Now, so popular. Subaru is actually quite a small company, so they definitely punch above their weight. And part of the reason is because of the Subaru WRX. Now, Martin, when I met you all those years and years ago, I had a 180SX and you had a Subaru. I want to know why people love them. But first of all, I know what you're wondering, how much do they cost? They do not seem to have jumped onto this crazy price bandwagon like all the other cars have. So, a non-wide body WRX hatch from around 2009, 2010, you can pick up for under $10,000. Or a GC8, which is like the Colin McRae looking one from PlayStation yep, 1. the original. Uh, also, you can get for around $10,000 as well. Martin, why do people love them so much? Um, they love them because you can do everything reasonably well. Um, so it's a good option, particularly if you're into like outdoorsy stuff. Uh, if you live somewhere where it's really wet or it's really snowy or it's really dirty, um, you have all wheel drive grip. That's been the selling point for a long time. I mean, the Rally Heritage sort of shows you that what they're capable of. Like an adventure car. Most people's right. memories of seeing these cars are them sideways going very, very, very quick. So they have Absolutely. a lot of sort of pedigree. They're, they're two litre turbo, um, almost all of them, depending which one you get, two or 2.5 litre turbo, which means lots of modifications. Uh, the drive lines are reasonably strong, depending what you do with them and there are upgrade options which I've done like adding six speed gearboxes to make them stronger, big diffs, lots of sort of um, fun aftermarket for it as well, a huge aftermarket. Now speaking of the aftermarket, when it comes to the style of how you want to make your WRX, it's also one of those cars that really leans itself to being able to perform really well across the board. So uh, people love them obviously as street cars, as dailies, yeah. motor carners, drag cars, you obviously don't see them kind of as drift cars but you do see very fast WRXs out at the track like 
pulling some excellent lap times. There's also an incredibly strong community around Subaru. There like really I would is. say it's actually one of the strongest. Yeah. There's the Subi Nationals. Yeah. Um, there's all sorts of different all meets. Over there's the track world. days there's and stuff that happen. massive national meets everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. And so if you're kind of going, you know what, I want to try and get into the car scene, I want to meet people, become part of a community, I think Subaru is probably a really, really good one yeah. uh, to be a part of. And the other thing is, is that other Subarus like the Subaru RS, which is a hatch but non-turbo, P-plate legal, you can modify one of them and then eventually if you move up and save up into a WRX because the RSs are cheap, you can move your wheels, you can move stuff over to your WRX because there are just so many parts available. So I guess you can build it up uh, in stages and P-plate legal. So let's have a quick look at the WRX. Impreza, WRX hatch, I absolutely love these. Oh, fruit man lady. <laughs> They're awesome cars. I used to have one of these, I had the uh, later model which was a wide body, but it's basically the same thing, mine just looked a little bit better. This here I don't know. This... is a whole lot of car, but not a whole lot of cash. Uh, five speed, they didn't get the six speed STI or whatever, but five speed, I think around 170 kilowatts at the engine, uh, 2.5 litre boxer, all the good WRX stuff, nice to live with every day, fast. Martin, why do people love these? I love them and it hurts me that this isn't number one because actually when I look at this particular build, which the owner's done a brilliant job of, I think it looks really clean. I think it's got some tasteful mods. I think it's got a bit of street cred, but also has all the great practical stuff. Hatch, heaps of space. You can put your whole family in if you want to, which is pretty awesome. Um, also, you can just do the normal WRX recipe to make them good. Dump pipes, turbos, reflashes, as go as crazy or as simple as you want. I really like this. I really, really do. This but car. is it the best bang for buck and the fastest out of all the things? Maybe not, but I think this ticks a lot of boxes. I'll tell you what this car did for a lot of people is that up until now, it felt like WRX is kind of, you had to be in a bit of a special club or a bit of a special crew. These came out and it kind of really, in a way, softened the image of it the did. car because it kind of looks like a Corolla. People go, oh, it kind of looks like a normal car. Now, yep. back in the day, what did reviewers say? I don't know, it got an eight out of 10 or something it's for soft, drivability. It's softer Fast. than the original. Yeah, it is, but that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. And inside, look at this. Yeah, you don't have all the fanciness, all the leather, all the whatever. You got super comfortable seats. You got everything again, exactly where you want. The gearboxes are just notchy and good. Yep. And people also go, you can't launch them really. The way that people are launching to actually break them is not the way that you would normally drive a car. You know what I'm exactly saying? Exactly right. Yeah, you, you know? can still have a lot of fun with this chassis and there's heaps of mods available. And like this owner's done, you've got cool wheels on there, lowered a bit, a few like nice tasty mods and I love the blue. Huge, huge fan. Now, we awesome. have done a build of one of these uh, on the show, which was uh, my car, so make sure you check that out. Basically, it had, you know, some, some wheels, some sub uh, suspension, exhaust, other stuff. Um, we did a bit of a series about that. Intake, this looks really nice. Intake, intercooler, it's also been rotated, so like with this extra, you know, ducting on there to make it to make use of it it's huge compared to a factory one blow off valve on there as well little exhaust it's got headers all stuff that you can also do progressively so you can just slowly change that stuff as you've got the budget to do it which will make it faster especially when you're on the road and roll the power on it's funny because seeing this now and seeing it like this no, and no. knowing you can get it for under 10 grand no, it no, makes Mike. me go maybe oh. our top five order is not right but that said we still got some good stuff to we come we do have some good stuff to come and this is about as i said budget performance and just getting the max, the most out of it. But yeah, this is a really nice Bang for buck and daily ability. Exactly. If you just have one car, that's what it's all about, one car. But there it is, uh, narrow body WRX, the wide bodies, because they look more wide body and JDM or whatever, they cost a bit more, you can't get them for this budget. But uh, for the money, for the mods, for the scene, this is an excellent car. So there it is, that is the WRX. But what is the Darth Vader to Luke Skywalker's vape cannon, Martin? <laughs> What is um, it? The classic, the classic enemy of all WRXs is Evos. The number of WRXs you see around that say Evo Muncher or Evo Hater or Evo Chop or whatever it is, it's just it's a bit ridiculous. Um, but Evos, uh, their price has really steadily risen, uh, partly because of availability. There was just less of them, particularly in Australia and in Japan. Uh, WRXs have just been made and, and broadcast all over the world, so there's a lot more of them out there, which means keeps the price down. Prices are going down. Evo prices are going up. So we're having a look around prices. An Evo 7, so that's an older one, completely thrashed and looking rubbish, around forty to $50,000. Yes. Uh, Evo's like the one that we used to have on the show, the blue one, which was a beautiful car, 
How much now? 70, oh, 50, 80? 50, yeah, for probably a really 50, nice 60 one. grand easily for one that's got that kind of case and then a bit of mods and been a little bit thrashed. And then, yeah, like a Tommy, uh, Tommy Mack and an Evo 6 or something, just forget it, six figures. They're yeah. just, there's not really any Subarus that will do that except for, say, the 22B, which is hundreds of thousands, but there's only 400 of them. Yeah. Or a two door like mine, which they're not six figures at the moment. They're just not. So Evos definitely um, have the price point and they're a bit sharper, you could say, to drive. Um, but I think the WRX is in terms of a car to live with and for the for the money you can't argue. Exactly. And the reason, the other reason that the Evo has become our negative alternative, I don't mean negative in terms of like it's bad, I mean it's an alternative for what we're talking about and why it hasn't made this list, because we could quite easily do a list that did make it, but the reason is because of the scarcity, because of the price of the cars, there is less community around them. And one less of the inclusive. things that we wanted to look at around this was the fun and the community aspect of the car. Yes, of course there is a community around Evo owners, of course there is, but if you're just looking at kind of Scale. larger scale meeting people on scale, then WRX is the way to go. Huge. Probably the other alternative for the money of a WRX is going to be a front wheel drive Lancer for 10 grand. Naturally aspirated. I'm not saying that it is a competitor to, but for the money, it's going to be a front wheel drive Lancer. We have a little bit of history with these cars. Let me say, we've had some quality Lancers on the show. Uh, there's Too Sexy, of course. There's the Green Machine. Was that a Civic? I don't even know what that was. Twisted. It was Twisted. It, they all start to turn into one big pile uh, <laughs> after a little while. Anyway, the next one may actually surprise you. We spent a long time trying to work out this list, but here is number three on the list. What is a car but a ticket to adventure? A key to another world? A community enhancing adventure seeking module for self exploration both on and off the road oh what are you talking about i'm talking about number three just tell them what car it is it's the toyota hilux yes everyone. it is toyota yes it hilux. is the toyota hilux <laughs> I, I, I know what just happened retention of this video just went meow what I can tell you is dual cab utes are an absolutely massive segment of uh, car driving, particularly in Australia. And as a segment, and we're going to run through why these reasons are, it is probably one of the most popular styles of car to modify now. Yep. They're absolutely huge, Martin. Yep. Absolutely huge. And why are they so huge now? I know when we say Hilux, you might immediately think big dual cab muddies. I'm not just talking about them. I'm talking about the rear wheel drive 2.7 litre ones with the 3RZ in it that you can add a turbo to and make 700 horsepower with some basic bolt-ons, yes, some mods, internal mods and a turbo. Can. Like you can go nuts. There is so much you can do with these cars. Uh, and it's the same car. You can go right through to mud, mud bog and crawling, whatever you want to call it. Um, with big, the big rigs, with mate. Big rigs. With Beers the diesel, and big rigs. With the diesel dual cab. So uh, we're going to cover off a few things about Hilux as to why they may be one of the best cars in this list. Now, one of the main things is in Australia, and I'm just going to talk about it. It might sound like it's a little bit boring, but before we kick on, it's a tax thing, people. Uh, often when you're getting a company car, a business car, you've got to keep logbooks and different things. With like a dual cab ute or a commercial vehicle like that, um, you just go. You can get an instant tax write-off. There are a number of different Hiluxes available. For the sake of this conversation, I'm going to talk about kind of the all-wheel drive um, dual cab for the sake of that. What are some of the benefits of this car? Number one, they are everywhere and they're almost indestructible. They are all over the world. There's parts available, so of course that covers things like wreckers, used parts, whatever. But the aftermarket for them, the aftermarket for them is absolutely yes. massive. It is so plentiful. And there's everything from performance mod snorkels, exhausts and stuff like that, through to camping, rooftop tents, uh, tires, brakes. Yeah. Uh, entertainment. It's absolutely crazy. And, it's and also they're tough. A, it's they're also, tough as old balls. It is a ticket to adventure. Uh, I mean, with it, we, we touched on it earlier with the Subaru. Yeah, you can go off-road and all-wheel drive and all that sort of stuff. But if you really want to go off-road, and obviously overlanding, four-wheel driving, camping outdoors has exploded in recent years, that is your access pass to be able to go. Your mates go, hey, you want to come camp? You go, yep. How am I going to get there? Okay, I'll get a Hilux. Oh, by the way, I need it for work to put a ton in the back of it. By the way, it's got four seats and four doors, so all my friends can come along, and it sort of starts to tick a lot of boxes, and I think that's why they're so popular, and also, the trade-off is not that high. Like, you know, 20, 30 years ago, a ute like that might be kind of crappy to drive on the road. Yeah, like, you could noisy, it. and yeah. and and now the Hiluxes, but, you know, ten year, ones that are even 10 years old are really, really nice to drive on the road as well. And it is something that if someone says, hey, let's go on an adventure and go camping, uh, it's not something you're going to take your Civic or your 180 or your GTR, like off-road through mud. Like, look, some people are going to, but most people are not going to do that. It is a car that lets you do a lot of different things. 
And people would go, well, you wouldn't take it to a track day. Of course you would. It would be towing your track car because it's the only car on our list that has proper towing capacity of two, three tonnes or so, depending on which one you get. So let's have a quick look around our work truck, which, believe it or not, is the Super Garage Hilux. Oh, what a feeling. Toyota Hilux, the unbreakable of all of the cars on our list. This is the most capable, the most amount of car that you're going to get that does everything. You can daily drive it, you can take it camping, you can tow your caravan, you can tow your race car, you can tow your broken drift car. It does absolutely everything and we're going to show you around the car, show you a couple of features. I'm going to show you what it does at the back and show you inside and Marty's going to show you what it does under here. Now this only just scrapes in because this one has nearly half a million kilometres but it's still going. One of the reasons it's still going, it has a three litre turbo diesel. Uh, ours is a manual, it's also got a transfer case so you've got low range and high range. That's about as fancy as it gets but that's actually good for most of the kind of off-roading that you'd need to do unless you're going crazy and dangling wheels around. Now let's talk about capability back here. I know dual cab utes often have like a different kind of uh, carrying structure at the back and rocks can carry their pallets and all that kind of stuff. Steel tray is actually really useful Very for us handy. because we're carrying away you know bits of cars engines stuff like that Parts. it's messy you can also fold this down and use it as a workbench which is really cool ours has a set of um, all-terrain BF Goodriches which really expands the usability of the car some people go muddies we've experienced that you don't really need to for most of your driving around and also a lot of people driving these really are driving them on the road with a bit of weekend warrioring as well the great thing is the interior is really basic we've added a head unit so you've got car play and you can literally clean it with a pressure washer and a leaf blower. It is that basic inside. And you know what? It may have done half a million Ks, but how much was it? 14 grand. 14, 14 grand. 14,800, something like that. Under 15K. It was under a 15 lot of, grand. A lot of car for that. And this is, how old is this? 10, 12 years old, 13 years old? Like it's yeah. not ancient. But Pretty it's oldish. You are going to be seeing some more of this car on the channel soon. And I just want to do a quick highlight to Shit Beer. Uh, these are calls that we've got, and you can check out shitbeer.org. It is our initiative to try and get clean water uh, to those in need. There's more information on that website. A portion of the money that we receive from selling the Shit Beer coolers, uh, of course, goes to uh, that charity to help them. And why give away your good beers when you can give your mate a shit beer? So check out shitbeer.org, um, give your mate a mad present of a shit beer cooler and also some of the money goes towards those in need. Works on cups too. When it comes to a negative alternative, and I don't mean the car again is negative, I mean an alternative vehicle that does this kind of thing but maybe for not as well or cost too much, there's no use going Ranger, Amarok, Navara, Triton same. because they're pretty much the same kind of thing. Yeah. But what I would say is that the alternative for this would be a Jimny. So a Jimny is also something that is amazing for adventure. It's great for off-road. You can take your mates, but it does lack a bunch of utility. So particularly, uh, you can't tow a whole lot with it. It doesn't have a tray and they're really, really expensive. So they're up near $25,000, $30,000 or more or for one of the newer Jimnys, $40,000 or $50,000. Whereas our um, Hilux that we bought was 14 grand. Yes, it had a couple of problems with it, but 14 grand, you just can't argue with it's that. It's very cheap. And yes, Hiluxes do hold their value, which you could look at as a positive thing if you own one. They hold their value a bit more than some of the other brands for the reasons we said, like them being so tough and unbreakable. Uh, but still, if you just save that bit more and put that little bit more money into the initial investment, you might end up with something that doesn't let you down. Exactly. Now, that brings us on to number two and number one of our top five list. And what I've got to say is that we have not been able to agree on which one should be the number one thing on our list because the next two, as far as we're concerned, are both number one. But we've agreed for the format of this video that we will make this one next. So this one here is number two. When it comes to a car that pretty much does it all, something that you can daily drive, has awesome aftermarket support, it's affordable, it's P-plate legal, you can turbo them, and as far as I'm concerned, is the number one car on this list not for these one, reasons. But we'll get to that. It is the, it's, this is the number one car it's on the list. It's your number one, but it's not the number one car on the list, but we'll get to that. Okay, <laughs> the car is the 86 or the BRZ. Why? Because, look, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you people, for the first few years that these were out, I was like, this car is so boring, there's so many of them, and then you drive it and you go, oh, all the journalists kind of, maybe they actually knew what they were talking about. These cars are so fun, there is so much aftermarket stuff available for them, they're just everywhere, and the thing is, they're popular in the States, they're popular in Japan, they're yep. popular in Australia, yep. they are all over the place, and Martin, you will admit that is a lot of, a lot of car 
for the money. It is a lot of car for the money. It also, unlike a lot of the other cars we've spoken about, is, is rear-wheel drive. And it was a big gap when any manufacturer made something rear-wheel drive that was affordable. Up to that point, it was like S14, S14, S15, and a few Toyotas. And then all of a sudden, there's this 86, which is an all-new chassis, co-developed with Subaru. So it has the flat engine, which keeps the center of gravity low. Really good balance, and people like to talk about that. And that balance does pay off through a corner, especially at speed. And if you're learning to drive fast on a track, it is one of the absolute best cars you can get in to do that kind of driving. I think that is the key point for this car, that you don't want to be going and doing your first track day in something that is like way overpowered when you don't know how to drive. This is a car that you can drive at 10 tenths and it's really going to deliver an amazing experience for you, both in terms of your education, but also on the track. And I think it's probably one of those analogies you can talk about with motorbikes as well. If you're just starting to ride, do you want to be on an R1 and just pegging it? Or do you want to be on like a CBR 250 or a 125 or on a Grom and really pegging it and learning the dynamics of how to drive it? That is, I think, what the car is all about. It also responds really well to modification and what I think the car was lacking when it first came out but makes a absolute bellissimo change is turbocharging it. So the car behind us, which is my BRZ, was turbocharged. It's a relatively quick process. We did it in around about a day. You get really good power from it. The car's got good traction control. It's not too intrusive when you're learning how to drive. And for that reason, that is the number one car. That is the number two car on our list. But let's have a quick look around the Mighty Car Mods BRZ. The Toyota 86 and its better looking twin brother, the Subaru BRZ, is the defining budget sports car of our generation. With really cheap skinny tires on the back, the car can be a whole lot of fun. It does really, really good skids, but with good rubber on it like this, this has got some Michelin Pilot Sports on it, you can also set some really good lap times. So people's biggest complaint about these cars is lack of power. It does have a two liter engine, but no turbos or anything. But what it lacks in power, it makes up for in the balance of the chassis. It's a 53-47 split. It feels very even, very predictable on the track. And the electronic driving assistance is actually really well dialed in for a stock car. Now, when it comes to the actual features you get in the car, even though it's only a two-door, you get four seats, of course, so you can carry your mates around. Inside, everything is exactly where you'd want it. The seats are really comfortable, really nice. Everything is laid out exactly where you'd expect it. There are lots of different interior mods and different cool things that you can do for the car. Everything's analog, so you got like nice uh, gauges, buttons, and things like that. But being that this is my personal car, we did fix some of the problems with the power, particularly a lot of people talk about this kind of little power dip that you have. And the way that we fixed that quickly and relatively affordably is with a turbocharger. How to fix a power dip. Use a turbo. Well. So this here, uh, we managed to install this um, all in a day. There's a full series if you want to watch how we did this. That there makes the car, like a lot of people say, this is how it should have been from the factory. That said, you don't need it to get started. And in fact, if you're starting out, it's kind of one of your first cars, you're starting to do some track days, wanting to start uh, seeing what your drifting ability is like. A stock one of these with some basic tires on the back is everything you're gonna to need to get started. The price of these is going up. Uh, BRZs cost a little bit more than 86s because they're like a bit nicer oh, yeah. inside, is a that A nicer right? interior spec and some differences in the bodies, front and rear, small things, but it's essentially the same car. Uh, this one here has got some nice wheels on it, a nice little lip kit, a few nice little pieces in it, but an 86 BRZ is gonna give you a wonderful experience for kicking off and getting going, which is why it is the number one car in our top five. Uh, well, second best. It's, we, it's good, but it's the second. We think it's pretty good. So what are some alternatives to the 86 slash BRZ? Well, if you go back in time a little bit, we can talk about Sylvia's. Uh, the problem there is cost. They are so expensive. Even a basic 180, you're looking at 20, 30 grand. Uh, you can at look least. at S15s, which are newer again, and they're like double that. Uh, there's a couple of big rear wheel drive other Toyotas you can get, you know, Aristos and stuff like that. A lot of them are auto. They don't have the sort of sports car feel that these cars do. Uh, I had a look and I found a Nissan 200SX. So that's an Australian delivered S15. Uh, over 300,000 kilometers and auto, $50,000. How much are you looking at for an 86 or a BRZ? Of course, I looked for cheapest. The price is going up, but $18,000. You've got 18 versus $50,000. Yeah. Uh, some of the other alternatives, of course, so you've got your 180s, you've got your S chassis. Um, MX-5s, Martin, but yep. the price of or, them has absolutely gone through the roof as well. Or maybe RX-7s as well, but again, just the expense. So MX-5 is the obvious one, because that's also a driver's car, a handling car. They are convertible, which some people look at as, as a downside, because you kind of want the roof if you're doing, like exclusively doing track days. Uh, they're also expensive, and even my one that I bought 10 years ago for 1,500 bucks, they're now 10 grand. They've gone up 10 times. Yeah. 
NB is the next one. They're probably the bargain at the moment. NCs, uh, they dropped and now they're high again. So they're arguably one of the better ones with a two litre. People call them a bit fatter, but they are actually a good thing. They drive really nice, they handle really well. $30,000, $40,000, so yeah, still expensive. And in terms of BRZ or 86 price, that we're saying, you know, the cheapest 86 there is is $18,000, BRZ's mid-20s plus. Uh, you can get those more recent uh, MX-5s, I don't know what they're called exactly, the little ones with the squishy lights. Indeed, yeah. They're like $30,000, oh, yeah, you know, but it's a, I, I don't know if that's really a competitor for this, it's a different kind of thing. Uh, but there are lots of alternatives for those. Negatives mostly, uh, because of the price when we're looking at a budget car to modify and I do think that the 86 you want to go fast and you want a car that you can daily it's the number one car it is but it's actually it not is, the number one car not? well no it's, it's the number two car in our list uh, but <laughs> the number one car we're going to get to right now but first of all before we get to that do you want to grab yourself a chopped lanyard we've got chopped Put lanyards and we've got Mighty Car Mods lanyards. These are both available right now on the Mighty Car Mods store. If you're one of those people that carries around two lanyards at once, like him, yep. you can be. Because <laughs> there's one of each. Too, many, uh, too many nuggets around here. We'll ship it to you. Anyway, uh, there it is. And also, if you want to, but you don't have to, we don't mind, you can hit the subscribe and the bell. You don't have to. But if you want Pick to, you can. Thing. It's actually cool. We'd like to see that. Now let's move on to the, after much number one. discussion no, and maybe some disagreement. One. It is number one. The number one car for performance, budget, do it all, yep. is this. All right, people, the number one car. The moment we've waited I can't, for. I can't believe I'm saying this, but we had to take all our own biases out of this. This is important that we just actually look at the figures and work out what is the best budget performance bang for buck car that you can buy at the moment. This is what we said. Fun, yep. affordability, fast. practicality, mods, yep. and available to make yep. it fast and easily. Bon bonus points if it is fast and some has some of that uh, excitement. And I can't believe I'm saying this, people, but it is a Golf GTI. Look it up. Look at how much car you get for the money. You can pay like half of what you'd pay for one of them and get something that's probably in reality gonna be faster, especially with the most basic of mods like a flash tune. Uh, you've got a 1.8 or a two liter engine, turboed from the factory. Good ones have fancy diffs in them that make them grip really well. They're also a really nice drivable daily car. So if you wanna spend that sort of, we've seen them for nine, ten thousand $10,000, as low as $8,000 for like a mad two to one. It looks kinda cool. It's maybe not as sort of flashy or unique as one of the, some of the other cars we've spoken about, but in terms of bang for buck, having a lot of fun, track days, mods, parts availability, and also just a nice car to be in and drive around Because let's not forget, it's very easy to ruin a car and make it undrivable, and then you end up hating it. These cars are very nice straight out of the box. Now, we have had a number of Golfs on the show over the years, obviously Mark III, I've had a Mark IV, Mark V, Mark VI, Mark VII. Uh, we made uh, probably the fastest Mark VII Golf R um, in the country and so we have spent a lot of time with these cars but what was amazing when we started looking into the prices mark 5 golf gti three door eight thousand yeah. dollars already with some modifications on it when you move up to the mark 6 which is a kind of a newer car i think 2012 onwards um, they look much nicer there's way more car to it but we're still only talking about under fifteen thousand dollars and you do get a lot of car for your money now there was a lot of discussion about BRZ86 versus Golf GTI. And it's like, why would that be number one? And Marty's one was quite simple. It was one word, turbo. Yeah. There is so much more that you can squeeze out of a car's performance. You put some good tires on it, you flash tune it, you're making hundreds of horsepower for less than $10,000. It's absolutely amazing. So why are there so many of them? Again, they were very popular cars. Even at the time they came out, they were popular because the price was good. They were that alternative to, uh, say, WX, for example, or an Evo, but they were European. At that point in Australia, people really started to fall in love with the Euro cars because they actually got really good. Your Mark IV, questionable in terms of reliability. The one we drove around Germany, also questionable. Just stuff didn't work. The five, six, and sevens and everything since, for us at least, our experience has been really good. Um, they've just worked really well. There's also a lot of knowledge out there as well. So if something does go wrong, they are just cars, people. That's the other thing. People go, Volkswagen, that golf's unreliable. Yeah, well, any hose that's been on a car for that long that's degraded or whatever it's been thrashed, it's, it's all gonna fail. It's all the same kind of thing. You just have to sort of change the way you think about it, slightly different tools to work on it. But overall, a hatchback, a hot hatch, and there's a reason that hot hatches are such a popular segment. 
they obviously have that heritage of kind of harking back for all of these decades, you know, probably since the Mark I all the way through. The other thing that's really interesting is I would say it's probably up there, if not greater, in terms of its community involvement, in terms of how many people are really into Volkswagens. Because here's the thing a lot of people don't realise. Obviously, we get them in Australia, you get them in America, you get them in Europe. In Japan, they are massive people over there them. and they're considered imports. So over there, you look Fancy. at High Performance Import Magazine, it has Volkswagens on the front of it and it has Golfs on the front of it. And as such, you see lots of really different styles of how people are modifying them and how they're working on them. The Mark IV Golf GTI, look, I know that was seen as a little bit of a flop. We owned one for a while, but we bought the cheapest Mark IV we could in Germany. We drove it thousands of kilometers. We went to we Austria, we, we went comfy. to Germany. We were comfortable, it didn't make heaps of power. And yeah, yeah, there were a couple of problems with it, but as a car to get in and go distance in, it was really, really good. So let's have a quick look around the Golf GTI. All right, people, the number one car is a Golf GTI. Yes, I can't believe I'm saying it, but we are talking about bang for buck. We're talking about budget performance and this around 10 grand. This one was actually for sale. We didn't have one of these available to look at. So we went on Facebook and looked for one and said, hey man, can we uh, film your car? And the guy was awesome and said yes. So here it is, Golf GTI, two litre turbo engine, four doors so you can fit all your mates in it. And because you're a Volkswagen owner, you've got a lot of mates. The interior is nice and plush and comfy and nice. Looks sporty, feels sporty. This one's a manual, which is awesome as well. So, I mean, for the purity, you can also get the DSG ones. They probably cost a little bit more with the auto flappy things. But and they, they go a little a bit faster. Car. But that said, right, we're talking about $10,000. You get something that's two litre, turbo. The inside is all leather. You got airbags and stuff everywhere. It's comfortable, it's manual. Yeah. Uh, this one here appears to have a few mods on it. It's got an intake and it's got some tunes and stuff. It's gonna be fast. It's got some nice wheels and stuff on it. For the money, I don't think you can really argue about it, even though I want to argue about it, because I'm still thinking about BRZs and doing skids and stuff. But that said, if you get a BRZ or an 86, and you have a Golf GTI with just a flash tune, this is going to walk all over it. You will, like, it's in a straight line, absolutely. Round a track, okay, that's when things start to get you from, but so many other things come into it on a track, like tyres and suspension, which you can do to both cars, and there's people that are running both these type of cars very successfully in all sorts of motorsport, whether it's rally sprints or track days or whatever it is. So this, I think, is number one, bang for buck, budget performance with a mad two litre turbo engine. So that's the Golf GTI, and I know you're probably wondering, why did we not mention the Golf R? That comes down to quite simply the price. Obviously the Golf R has a power advantage, it has all wheel drive, there's lots of tech. The price of them has become absolutely ridiculous. So a Mark 7 Golf now we've seen for up around $60,000 and I think a lot of that has been inflated by the release of the Mark 8 Golf R which originally was listed as a price of $65,000 plus drive away. We're seeing them now being sold for upwards of 85, 90 and even 95 thousand dollars so i think a lot of people they want to go back to the mark 7 or the mark 7.5 because it's got the physical buttons a bit more of an analog feel and that has just brought the prices of everything up but it has not yet affected the uh fours and the fives and the sixes as much so that is why the golf r did not make the list because it's just way too expensive. And it's worth remembering that the Golf R basically is just a GTI with all-wheel drive. So it, is. it yep. unlocks that, which some people really like. Some people need it, and this is why if you're thinking about, I definitely need all-wheel drive, cool, go get a Subaru instead, uh, but you don't get that sort of Euro-ness. Um, but in terms of just having, yeah, turbo engine, um, lots of mods available, then we think a GTI is the sweet spot in terms of the price. Now, what are some alternatives when it comes to the price? I'm just gonna say, for the amount of performance and power you get, there's actually not much else in that sub ten thousand dollars. Something like Renault's and, and there's like some other European cars that because they're in a similar class in Europe, yes. a sort of similar price point. But in our market in Australia, there's much less of everything else. Therefore, the prices are higher. But we are talking Renault, Megans, yeah, Clio's, Clio's that sort of stuff, stuff, stuff like that that you might be able to find. But the prices of those are starting to go up as well. So there it is. That is. I can't believe it. The but number it's true. one. That is the number one. Bang now, for there people. are a couple of notable mentions, Martin, that we probably should have a quick chat about for as sure. well. Because I know what everybody's thinking right now. Where were the Daihatsus on the list? Yeah. Where were they? We own so many of them. There's the K-Truck. There's the Midget. There's the Mira. Yep. Then we've got things like Super Turbo, like Nissan Super Turbo and other weird little cars that are in that same kind of class. So Martin, where were the Daihatsus? Well, the Daihatsus are only in Japan. That's part of the problem. We used to get them in Australia and now we don't anymore. So even though Toyota bought them and owned them, it's now just their sort of small car company within that. They're also like a smaller car, generally, in, in terms of class. A lot of them are K cars, so tiny engines. Not really performance things. If you line up just about any Daihatsu you can buy with a GTI, the GTI is going to absolutely smash it. So not really as much about performance. But if you want to look a bit more unique and a bit more, you know, 
something a bit more silly, then perhaps that's a car you could think about too. The other obvious exemption, of course, from this list is the GR Yaris. Yep. The Yaris GR. What do you call it, Mark? Excellent car. The Yaris. An Yaris, excellent right. car, but unfortunately, also just way too expensive because they're now asking second-hand prices more than they cost new exactly. because of availability. So you can get them in Australia when they're new for about 40 grand, the first thousand people. Then they sort of went up to high 40s. Now even second-hand, most cars are selling in the 50s and there's no uh, sign yet of them being reintroduced. The price hasn't dropped. In five years from now, if they can stand the test of time with reliability, they are going to be the top of this list. Five or ten years' time when the price really drops. But right now, that's just new car territory. Now, obviously, this list here was built up on fun, practicality, availability, what's available now and at this time and in our country. And I think it's also worth mentioning that this is all really about price point. Now, most of these cars that we found, none of them were over $15,000. And to give that some kind of relativity to where you're from, the average wage in Australia, I think like then an average low wage is like 40 or $50,000 yeah. a year. Yeah. So it's about a third of the average low wage. So in your country, you can kind of work out what those numbers mean for you. Now, if you start taking price out of the equation, then things start to get a little bit skewed. And if you look at, say, an average car price of thirty dollars or $40,000, it's opening up Heaps very, very options. different vehicles. And yeah. that would probably be looking like a very different list. And if that's something you're interested in, then we can certainly give you our opinion on what that does as well. But if you're looking for a budget car that you can afford with not a whole lot of money, that's a whole lot of fun, that there, is our list. So thank you very much for everybody who's watching. If you're new to the channel, welcome. There are hundreds and hundreds of videos that we've been making over the last 15 years on how to modify Heaps. cars, adventures and stuff like that. A lot of these cars we've mentioned we've actually already modified before. So we'll have some links in the description where you can go through and have a look at that. There it is everybody. Thank you very much and we'll look forward to seeing you next time on Mighty Car Mods.